It's big dog season. And you can't stay still because you want it. Mm-hmm. Talk that talk, George. You still scraping your plate because you're hungry. Mm-hmm. Talk that talk. More than 100,000 Americans are dying from drug overdoses every year, largely from the synthetic opioid fentanyl. But in recent years, no city has been hit as hard as Baltimore when it comes to overdose deaths. Special correspondent Christopher Booker takes a look at why. It's part of our ongoing series, America Addicted. You have my number, right? Yes, you got it. Okay. So in I'm this West this Baltimore neighborhood, everyone number. seems to know Donna Bruce. You be careful out here. You got Narcan? After years of battling drug addiction, Bruce is now in recovery, but she still remembers just how tough this life can be. Because we got to give them some resources so they can get to housing and stuff like that. Today she runs a nonprofit that provides support okay. to families who have lost loved ones to overdose, and she helps those still struggling with addiction connect to social services and find treatment, a process that often starts with some basic questions. Why are you here? How did you end up here? Like, what can we do to help you today? Right? And those are the questions that stimulate relationships with people to be open to say, okay, listen, yeah, I do get high. Yeah. Put your hands on your eyes. All right, on the day we joined her, Bruce had come with her seven-year-old granddaughter, Cassidy. I got a big surprise to show you. She wanted her to see a new street sign named in honor of her son, Devon Wellington, Cassidy's father. Devon Wellington's way. Wow. Look at that. It was here in the summer of 2021 that the 32-year-old died from a drug overdose. I'll never forget. Um, I couldn't help my own son. Okay, it's right up here. Just a few miles away, Mona Southerly is also going back to where tragedy struck. He was funny and he always seemed happy. Satherly's 43-year-old son, Bruce, was found dead from an overdose at this abandoned Baltimore row house in 2022. The last time she saw her son, he told her that he and was headed to an addiction treatment program. He left. I gave him a hug. We were okay. And uh, that's the last conversation I had. She says her son had likely been dead for about a month before his body was discovered. He left February 15th. And that's the day I feel like he died because I never heard from him again. And... I wasn't worried about it because I thought he went to rehab. And people kept asking me, have you heard from him? And I'm like, no, no, I'm sure he's fine now. I'm sure he's fine. And then after 30 days, I called the police. While the city has long struggled with addiction, the arrival of the synthetic opioid fentanyl hit Baltimore particularly hard. Up to 50 times more potent than heroin, in the past six years, almost 6,000 people have died from an overdose. An average of three people every day. No major American city has had a drug overdose crisis as severe as Baltimore's today. Alyssa Zhu and Nick Team are reporters for the Baltimore Banner. They will have someone speak around 12.15. For the last two years, they've been investigating the city's overdose crisis in collaboration with the New York Times. Something that we have just heard over and over again is that every day we get a homicide tally, but we don't get the same for overdoses. and numerically, it is a far greater problem. But getting that data wasn't easy. In 2022, after months of repeated requests for the city's autopsy reports, the banner sued the state's office of the chief medical examiner. In January, a judge ruled in their favor. We knew that these were public records and the public should know, you know, what's happening in the city uh, in terms of overdose deaths. From the moment that data ended up on my computer, we started investigating. And you look at it, and I mean, the entire city is colored with overdose deaths. Blocks in some of the poorer parts of southwest Baltimore have lost upwards of 8 and 9 percent of their population to a fatal overdose. Their reporting found that overdoses began spiking in Baltimore about a decade ago as fentanyl ravaged a city grappling with multiple challenges, including gun violence and later the pandemic. They also found that one demographic has been hit especially hard, older black men, who make up just 7% of the city's population, but account for nearly a third of all overdoses. They die at higher rates from overdose than they did from COVID at the height of the pandemic, from all cancers put together. There is nothing statistically 
that kills this group of people more than fatal overdose. How does the city respond to your reporting? They were very defensive. Um, they called our reporting misguided victim blaming. And they were saying that our reporting should have focused on opioid manufacturers' role in all of this um, because they are currently uh, litigating against pharmaceutical companies. This summer, Baltimore has reached $90 million in settlement agreements. The first with pharmaceutical giant Allergan, and just last week with CVS for their roles in the city's overdose crisis. And a September trial is set for several other defendants, including Walgreens and Johnson & Johnson. Citing the litigation, Baltimore's Mayor Brandon Scott declined our interview request, but his office provided the NewsHour with this statement. For years, manufacturers and distributors of prescription opioids targeted Baltimore with hundreds of millions of prescription opioid pills. This reporting faults the city for its efforts to clean up the mess these companies made. I think we need to understand the problem. Last month, Baltimore Councilman Mark Conway, who chairs the city's Public Safety Committee, planned a public hearing looking into what the Banner's investigation found. We as public officials need as much information as possible in order to be effective on the changing nature of, of drug overdoses. But just hours before Conway's hearing was scheduled to start, it was abruptly canceled. Baltimore's mayor said a public hearing could endanger the city's litigation against opioid manufacturers. For the city council not to be briefed, and not to have transparent, open conversations about what we're dealing with because of pending litigation, I think is a mistake because we have decisions that we should be considering right now. While the litigation continues, many Baltimore families are still coming to grips with all that's been lost. I never thought he was dead. I never, ever thought that. When Mona Southerly finally got an update on her son, Bruce, it was the kind of news that no mother wants to hear. When they found him, the police called and said, can, can I come over? And I was like, sure. He didn't even tell me. He just sat down and I sat down and I was like, I could see, I knew. I said, don't, please don't tell me that. Today, she wears a necklace that her son was wearing at the time of his death and tries to remember the good times. We did so many things that I am so grateful for. And he made me so happy. You know, I wanted a lot more years, but you have gotta be grateful for the time that you're given. So this is Devon Wellington's way. You can come here whenever you want and see your daddy's street name after him. All right. Donna Bruce is now using her son's death to try to reach as many people as she can before it's too late. My son had to die for me to live. As if he understood that this was part of my assignment. For Cassidy. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Christopher Booker in Baltimore. Back now with the troubling rise of a new drug making its way across the country, pink cocaine. The mystery drug hitting the club scene with urgent warnings from the DEA and prosecutors tracking closely. Eyewitness News investigative reporter Dan Krauth has this story. It's just as colorful as New York City's nightclub scene, but the narcotic cocktail could be dangerous, even deadly. Well. I mean, it looks like cotton candy. You know, it may have that kind of appeal to somebody. But there's nothing fluffy or sweet about it. You have no idea what you're taking. The drug supply has never been more dangerous in this city. It's called pink cocaine. It's actually not cocaine. In the cases the New York City Special Narcotics Prosecutor and DEA have seen, when it's lab tested, it actually has very little to no cocaine at all. Instead, a mixture of cheaper man-made drugs, from ketamine to ecstasy. So the only ingredient that won't get you high is actually the food coloring. Yeah, that's right. A mixture of dangerous uppers and downers. When you see that mixture of your body being pulled in two directions, being um, amped up with a methamphetamine or a cocaine, and being sedated with something like ketamine, you know, that's a recipe for a terrible, terrible effect on the body. The DEA says in some cases, the deadliest of drugs, fentanyl, is also getting mixed in. This is two milligrams of what would be considered a lethal dose of fentanyl. Where even a tiny amount can be deadly. They're mixing fentanyl in because they want to increase addiction. They want to increase their customer base. They want more people to come back and buy their drug. And it's, it's something that 
every parent should be concerned about. These drugs aren't being sold as you might think on street corners. Prosecutors say they busted a New York City woman this summer for selling pink cocaine on a messaging app through her cell phone. Here's what authorities say was her menu of drugs for sale. She's accused of then shipping the drugs through the mail straight to customers. You have this, this uh, criminal underworld that has weaponized social media to push their poison to the far reaches of the United States and across the globe. According to law enforcement sources, with the use of technology and social media, the mystery mixtures are easier to get than ever before, and there are more drug overdose deaths reported than ever before. The bottom line, they say, there's no longer any such thing as safe experimentation, no matter how colorful it might be. And our thanks to investigative reporter Dan Kraut from WABC Eyewitness News here in New York for that. And we should note that the woman arrested for selling those drugs pleaded not guilty to the charges. All right, let's bring in Dr. Derry now for more on this story. And let's talk about this lethal cocktail. You're talking about methamphetamine, which is an upper, mm -hmm. uh, ketamine, which is a downer and mixed together, it can wreak havoc on your body. Absolutely, and this is the problem. The majority of overdoses are associated with what we call in medicine polypharmacy. That's when there's someone is using more than one substance. Most often, believe it or not, it's alcohol. And many think because alcohol is legal, accessible, that it's something safe to use with these substances of abuse. But in many cases, alcohol can increase your risk of overdose and brain damage. So it's really important to pay attention to these substances. My job as a physician is not just warning people about the risk, but helping them reduce those risks. So doing these things safely and the number one risk that creates a, a reason why people come into the ER is when things are combined or mixed. Mm -hmm. Don't mix. I mean, you shouldn't do the illegal drugs in the first place. But exactly. The other thing with these designer drugs that's really concerning is the fentanyl of yes. it all. And the, uh, just a tiny bit of fentanyl could kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Enough, a small raindrop, uh, a, a small amount of fentanyl can be lethal. And uh, the problem also is that fentanyl can last in the system for a period of time. And so when you think that the symptoms are gone, patients can recur and then land themselves back in that dangerous situation. It's one of the reasons why we pay attention to educating people about what fentanyl overdose looks like. For example, if you notice that someone is unconscious, most importantly, if they have slowed or no breathing, if you're finding that they're not responsive to aggressive stimulation, if they have constricted or really, really small pupils or bluish lips or fingers, those are signs that they're not getting enough oxygen, they might be suffering from a fentanyl overdose. And that's why I think it's so important to understand how to use naloxone or Narcan. Mm -hmm. This is a reversal agent agent is, is a nasal spray and one spray in a patient's nose can help to reverse and block those effects of Narcan. When you're using this, you can remember usually they come in a pack of two and that if the patient, the, the person doesn't have a response, you can wait two to three minutes and then use another dose. And then of course, you're going to make sure that you're calling 911 regardless, even if they wake up and they say that they feel fine because the symptoms can relapse and recur. And again, how easy is it to use and, and, and can anyone use it to save a life? Anyone can use it and I understand so many are fearful of it, but if you have any any suspicion that someone who is unconscious mm -hmm. and might be suffering from a fentanyl overdose, you can't go wrong with trying to use this. Many people are fearful that maybe they'll use it inappropriately. There are many times when I have patients who come into the emergency room after suspicion, we work them up and we realize that it wasn't, but it's still good to use this regardless because you don't want to miss those cases where this could save a life. So this can't harm someone. Exactly. It's right. good to know. Yeah. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Of course. Good morning. Today is Monday. It's August 26th. The year is 2020. Lord, good Lord. You know, I don't use drugs. I don't get high. I don't do marijuana. I don't do coke. I don't do meth. But y'all, everybody I knew was on drugs. Meth, coke, pills. Everybody I know is on some type of drug getting high. It's just so weird to me. I mean, over the years, I've had so many friends get hospitalized from drug overdose and to die from drug overdose. Oh, oh Lord, the nigga didn't die. So, but I saw this thing in Baltimore was going on with all these people, these young folks doing these drugs and overdosing. It is a major problem nationwide in so many cities from Atlanta, Baltimore, D.C., I mean, Los Angeles, New York, it's everywhere. Even small towns, you, you mean small little cities like uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, uh, what's the capital of Mississippi? Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson. Now, what is that city? Jackson, Mississippi. So we have these problems. We haven't really dealt with 
you know, I guess I guess I grew up in the era where they said uh, just say no to drugs. But um, when you have recording artists and singers and rappers and hip hop artists making music uh, promoting drug industries um, in the gay community, they actually have events where drugs are promoted by the people who run the events. Um, I have had so many friends who are hooked on drugs like ketamine, ketamine or methamphetamines and just opioids and um, you just have to wonder what's going on in people's minds. Why did why why is it why are these drugs becoming such a huge problem? And you see, it kills a lot of people, killing them dead. And then they get a home. You get hold of the wrong drug today, you may not survive that high. And, but just about everybody I know, even people that go to the gym and work out, people I know who are in the gym in fitness look great, working out, exercise, doing all that stuff. Hey, on drugs. I'm like, okay, but everybody's on drugs these days, and it's gotten to a point where. I don't really go to too many events or parties because everybody's in there smoking, getting high, and doing. You know, there's a difference between you just doing a little marijuana, but they pass those days. You know, everybody's doing coke, they're doing meth, they're doing molly, they're doing ketamine, everybody's getting high. And they just describe it as such a great feeling. Watch, you've got to try this. You're going to love it. You're just doing great. Just listen to the music. The music is great. And I'm looking at them thinking, are y'all in lost y'all fucking mind? I'm not doing those pills and powders y'all doing. To be sitting there, I, I can just, the music's fine to me. I, I'm, I just don't get it. But I'm telling y'all, everybody's doing this. It doesn't matter the income, the education, the background. I know people who are doctors, nurses, lawyers, police officers, law enforcement, everybody getting high. And I would think about, so is anybody testing these people? Obviously not. Everybody's getting high, everybody's doing drugs, everybody's just. And as a society, we're paying a heavy price with the, the, the people who are dying from this stuff. And you all have to understand something too. I've been ostracized and, and not, not allowed in certain spaces because I don't participate in doing drugs. Certain parties, certain events, certain stuff, I've not been invited back to because. I didn't participate in the coke that was being passed around or the pills they had or because I didn't want to participate, I didn't get invited back or was just banned. I never forget years and years ago, I was helping a club promoter here in Atlanta and they were getting ready for an event. And we were all getting ready. I was in there helping get ready for the event, putting balloons up, doing all kinds of stuff. And now suddenly the guy who owned the club showed up with this stuff. He had this plate. And everybody was sniffing his coke and stuff. And I looked over there and I said, and it was literally this few feet from me. And I looked. And I guess they saw the look on my face. And I was just kind of like, what are they doing? And they just, everybody was just, you know, no big deal. And, you know, and I was just kind of in shock because I went back to doing what I was doing, helping them get rid of And this is like 2009, 2010. And I was, went back to doing what I was doing. I was thinking, the people, the people who I saw, I would have never thought that they were doing that. Never. So I used to be green about this type of stuff. Really, because I was about 40 years old at this point. But because I had been in a relationship and sort of not in the scene or in the clubs or in the, you know, this is where they were just coming out with the bottle service and the sections and stuff. So I didn't really know what was going on. Now I am fully aware. I know what's going on. I was in Miami one time. Minding my business in the club, they get some guys saw me. They invited me into the VIP section. Everybody was sitting there. They were just doing stuff right there in the open. I was just like, "Whoa!" And I remember sitting there, had my little drink, and I was like, oh, no, "I'm good." I didn't stay there long. Do what you want to do. It's your life. I'm strong enough to know that there's no way you're gonna use peer pressure to force me to do something I don't want to do. I've lost too many friends who died from no drug overdoses. They find their ass dead in they wherever. 
in various cities here in America. You know, so for me, do if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But it's not for me. And it's sad because I know so many people I'm close to who are involved in this stuff. So many people. I mean, it really just swept through the gay community. And, you know, it's just, you know, but it's, it's a problem with gay people, straight people, black people, white people, wealthy people, poor people. It don't matter. It just, it is, it, it, I'm sure you all probably know people too who have had issues with these drugs or are having issues now. And, um, I would tell anyone, just be careful what you decide to do in life because once you go down that path, everybody I know who started off first, you know, with a couple of pills here, popping a pill here, I don't know what these pills are, Molly's, I guess, I don't know, ecstasy, there's a bunch of different stuff out there. And then they get deeper and deeper and deeper and they lose everything, including their lives. I've seen this happen so often. I've seen it happen so often. Some people are able to break free and live in, and some people are able to get out, get away from it and clean their act up and, and live normal life. But then some people try to lose everything. Everything. Including their life. So it's a major problem out there. Massive problem. That's killing people every day. Teenagers, old young people. You would, like I said, doesn't matter the income, the edu level of education, the background. None of this shit matters. None of it matters no more. So, just be careful out there. The decisions that you all make. You know, like I said, there's a lot of pressure to participate in this stuff. I've been people have tried to pressure me even in recent years. A few months ago, somebody gave me some ketamine pills. Who tried this when you get home? And I didn't know what it was. I had to get home and Google it. And I'm like, what is this ketamine thing? What is this? And I'd be very honest with y'all. When he gave them pills to me, I was thinking, oh, this must be some X, some type of workout pill or something. Literally. In my head, oh, you give me, this must be some new um, exercise pill or something. So I think I was just left the gym and I met up with him. He's like, oh, you got to try this ketamine. Then I Googled it. I was driving down the highway. Shit. Driving down the highway, trying to um, Google that mess, and I just made a decision. When I got home, I Googled, I threw that shit in the trash. I was like, okay, this is just to get high. Now, a few years back, I took, a friend of mine makes these edibles. I ain't seen that boy in a minute. But this was a few years ago, and he brought me these edibles he wanted me to try, and I ate a brownie. It's a little brownie, a little small little thing. I'll never forget it. A little chocolate brownie. Not knowing I wasn't supposed to eat the whole damn thing. And I ate the whole damn thing. Because I took a bite of it and nothing happened. And, and it was just like a little, to me, it was like a little brownie. Little, and I ate the whole thing. Lord, that was the worst weekend. I did that on a Friday night. I don't think I woke, woke up from that stupor until Sunday or Monday. Literally, I was stuck in the house that whole weekend. I whole weekend was shot because of that one damn brownie the paranoia the scaredness the um the fear the, the anxiety created uh that one edible brownie i was done with that honey i didn't even touch it no more that was it everybody you, you gonna like it no i did not like it not only did not not only did i not like it i didn't want nothing to do with it anymore i don't need i don't need any edibles That's just not for me. It's not something I need to experience. I don't need any drugs. I don't need to get high. I don't need no meth. I don't need no coke. I don't need no marijuana. I don't need none of it. Just give me a vodka and cranberry and just a few of those and I'm good to go. But it is unfortunate that so many people have gotten themselves involved in stuff. People I know people educated, smart, careers, wonderful careers, 
one of my friends, he's like a, a friend of mine who lives in D.C. in education. Um, I never would have thought that he finally confessed to me that he was having these, he got cooked up on cocaine. He just he was dating a guy, and the guy introduced it to him, and he, he rode that roller coaster for years, and you know. Never would have guessed this young man was never ever 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 in a million years would have guessed he had the issues going on. Never would have guessed that. Somebody's at my door. Let me see what this is. Anyway, my sister. Anyway, I'll call y'all back. I'll call y'all back. I'll be back. Let me go see what's going on with her crazy ass. I'm back.